grace and peace be unto you in the name of God, who is my Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and as always, the powerful indwelling of Holy Spirit. I am Elijah. I walk in the office of prophet, teacher, some say pastor, but most of all, a servant. I thank you and I praise God for you, for those of you who are able to tune in with us on this evening. I know the hour is just a little later. We usually come on at 6.30, but to the glory of God, we were attending a service down in Norfolk. I had the opportunity, the honor, and the privilege to serve on the panel of the prophetic panel that was there um, under Apostle Tim Thornton and his wife, Prophetess Joy Thornton. And um, we had a Holy Ghost good time. Uh, um, Prophet Rawls was there. Uh, Prophet, um, trying to remember the brother's name, Joseph something. I, I Forgive me for not remembering his last name, but he was there. He was on the panel as well. Uh, Apostle and myself, and we really had a good time in the Lord. Um, Holy Spirit showed up. He showed out. The word went forward four times over. We had a very, very, very small question and answer session, um, a lot of prayer, and afterward, Apostle cooked some amazing spaghetti, and we had some salad, and we had some good fellowship, and I'm just telling you, we had a good time in the Lord. It's an honor every time the Lord finds you trustworthy and calls upon you to stand before one or 100 and declare what he has said in the name of Jesus. It is not something that I ever take lightly. It is not something that I take for granted. I am honored that the Father found me to be a vessel of honor, fit and meet for his use at this hour. The brothers did a wonderful job. They did a wonderful job. They bought that word. It was rightly divided, and we had a Holy Ghost good time. If you couldn't make it, there is going to be another one. Uh, so when you see it posted, um, find time to come. It's amazing that we, the people of God, we find time to do everything but travel for a service. We find time to go to the family reunion. We find time to go to the company picnic. We find time to hang out in Walmart or Food Line for six or seven hours. We find time to find out what Victor Newman is doing on The Young and the Restless. We find time to, to watch Power and all these other shows. But when it comes to going to the house of the Lord and serving the Lord, we never have time. It's always an excuse. But that's all right. Because a lot of people who make excuses for not being able to come and worship with us here, they're not going to have to worry about making an excuse on the other side of glory because you're not going to be invited. But that's a whole other story. But I just praise God for the service that we had today in the name of Jesus. So before we get into our lesson, let's go before the throne of grace in a word of prayer. Eternal God, my Father. I bless you and I thank you for this day. I bless you and I thank you for this hour of study. I bless you and I thank you for this opportunity to come before your people, Lord God, and unfold unto them the things you have unfolded and shared with me, that we will be edified, O oh God, that we could, could examine ourselves and grow accordingly. I ask, Father, that those who you allow to tune in, that you would give them an ear to hear what you are saying to your people at this hour, how you're building up your body, how you're educating and correcting and, and, and teaching your body at this very hour. I ask, Father God, that anybody who would tune in that don't know you as Lord and Savior, they would hear something and that they would hear and feel the compelling of the Holy Spirit drawing them and that, Father, even where they are, they would cry out for salvation. And now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you anoint me yet again with that anointing and makes preaching and teaching easy. That you touch my mouth. That you touch my ears. That you touch my mind. In the name of Jesus, that you set your coal upon my lips. That you would give those who would tune in ears to hear and a heart 
to receive in the name of Jesus. Father, I bless you. I thank you. I praise you for this and for all things. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Again, I bless the Lord for this hour of Bible study. And before we get into this, let me share something with you. When the service was over and we had a time to fellowship with some of the brothers and sisters, I was speaking to a young lady and I, I, I can't remember her name and her name is irrelevant, but she said something that bothered me. It bothered my spirit. She said that she traveled to, to, to watch a, a man who called himself a prophet and, and he had a service and then he had a deliverance service. But throughout the entire deliverance service, he never used the name of Jesus. He, he never called on the power of the Holy Spirit. And she said that she was always told, because you have power, you don't have to use the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, those of you in ministry, those of you who, who, who call yourself a prophet, those of you who call yourself an apostle, a pastor, a bishop, a teacher, a missionary, those of you who clean the bathrooms in the church, listen. If you don't hear nothing else I ever say to you, I need you to hear this right here and right now. If there is a deliverance service going on, and if you are one of the ones that are called to pray over people, if you're not called to pray over people, but your presence in the house during a deliverance service, if you are not directed, called, led and filled by the Holy Spirit. Do not go up there laying your hands on anybody, praying over anybody, trying to cast out demons in your own name or in no name. Listen to what the prophet is telling you right now. Even if you follow the examples in scripture, Paul did everything he did in the name of Jesus. Peter did everything he did in the name of Jesus. Anybody that's trying to cast out demons, anybody that's trying to call out dark spirits, if you do not have Holy Ghost power and you do not use the name of Jesus, you're about to get yourself whooped up one side of the church and down the other. It is not a game. Now, whoever it was she was watching, whoever it was she went to Florida to see that did not use the name of Jesus, let me tell you something. There was not a spirit cast out. A spirit went nowhere. I don't care how much power you think you have. You have nothing without the name of Jesus. I don't care how much knowledge of the scriptures you think you have. You have nothing without the indwelling Holy Spirit. So anybody who tells you you can cast out demons and devils and you don't have to use Use the name of Jesus. They're either from Hollywood writing a movie or they're a liar. One of the two or both. We can do nothing without Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without the name of Jesus. It's the only name that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. It's the only name that demons and devils will hear and tremble. It's the only name that Satan is going to respect enough to leave. So if you go to a service and the name of Jesus is not being invoked, you need to leave that service. If you're under a minister and they're praying over you and they're not praying in the name of Jesus, you need to stop allowing them people to put their hands on you and go somewhere where Jesus is being taught and where the Holy Spirit is moving. And that's all that. That's just a little side note. But it needed to be said. Our lesson tonight is, is, is more of a, a, a Bible study, but it's, it's a Bible study for your education. Because all of us have heard the story of the prodigal son. We've heard it so many times that most of you know it by heart. And for the sake of this lesson, I'm going to read it to you. But I need you to understand it's more than what you heard. Because we hear about a man who had two sons and one of them wanted his inheritance before he was supposed to get it. And the father gave him his half and he went out and he spent it on riotous living and then he didn't have nothing. He was about to eat the pig food. He said, I'm going back home and apologize. His father seen him coming from afar off. He ran out. We hear him say, kill the fatty calf, put a ring on his finger and all that old other stuff. And that's what we hear about the prodigal son. It's always about 
His father seeing him from afar off and running out to meet him. And we always hear people say, God is waiting for you to come back. God is waiting for you to return. He's going to run out to meet you. But what we need to understand, what Holy Spirit wants you to understand tonight, is so much more meat to the story of the prodigal son that you need to understand. Because his, his, his fall, his fall had stages to it. There was a different name, a different spirit, a different feeling for every fall of his stage. It was seven steps before he hit rock bottom. And then it was seven steps for him to be reconciled back to the father. And what Holy Spirit wants us to understand is each of those steps. Because when people today fall, when people today fall away from God, it's not just a drop from where you are to rock bottom. It's steps that take place. And we have to be able to recognize the steps so that when we intercede for people, when we pray for people, we know exactly what we're praying about. And so tonight's lesson is a study on that. Let me read this to you. I'm in Luke chapter 15, and I'm starting at verse 11. And whatever version you have, follow with me. I'm from the King James Version, and we're going to go through this. I promise you it's not going to take long. But the Word of God says, a certain, and he said, talking about Jesus, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance on riotous living. And when he had spent all he had, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For my son, for this my son was dead, and is alive again, and he was lost, and is found, and they begin to be merry. Now, I don't have to read the rest of this, this particular uh, passage. We, we can stop right there, and what I want you to understand is, it's seven steps that went down. Seven steps. So let's go right back to this passage and let's see what's going on. And let's identify these seven steps that took this young man down. When we begin at verse 11, it says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And verse 12, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. Right here in verse 12, we see the first step of his downward decline. And he said, give me the portion that falleth to me. It's called self-will. Self-will was his first step for a downward decline. What is self-will? Self-will is defined as doing what you want in spite of knowing what's right. So this young man already knew that he was not supposed to receive his inheritance at this time. But he wanted what he wanted when he wanted it because of his self-will. He did not even recognize what was going on. But self-will was the first step of his downward decline. 
doing what you want in spite of knowing what's right. So let's keep reading. And not many days after, the younger son gathered together, gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, right there in 13, we got a lot of steps. It's three steps in verse 13. In verse 12, we had self-will. So in verse 13, we come across selfishness. Selfishness. Selfishness is defined as you only care about and have concerns for you and you disregard everybody else. This young man had no care or concern about his father, his brother, or anybody else because his selfishness made him only see what he wanted. His selfishness was working with his self-will. We also have in this same passage, and he took a journey to a far country, separation. Distancing yourself from others. Separation. His selfishness caused him to separate himself from everybody else. His self-will Doing what he want led to his selfishness. His selfishness led to separation. He separated himself from everybody else. What else do we have right here in verse 13? And there wasted his substance with riotous living. We have sensuality. He fell under the spirit or the sin of sensuality. And what is sensuality? Pleasing and fulfilling the desires of the flesh, physical fleshly pleasures, desiring the physical fleshly pleasures and fulfilling them. So we had self-will, selfishness, separation, which led to sensuality. These are all part of his downward decline. Each step took place at a different time, even if it was back to back, but it took place at a different time. So we see this young man being drawn further and further away from what he knew to be right because he wanted to fulfill the lust of his flesh. He wanted to fulfill what he wanted to fulfill. And in doing that, he's progressing downward. Self-will, selfishness, separation, sensuality. Let's keep going. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land and he began to be in want. So what do we see right there? We see spiritual destitution. Spiritual destitution. He was spiritually desolate. What does that mean? It means helpless and powerless to accomplish anything, especially anything spiritual. It said, and when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He was desolate. He was powerless to do anything. There was a famine there and he could do nothing about it. So take that and put it to the spiritual side. It's the same thing as there being a spiritual famine in the land and you have no power to change your situation or circumstance. You have no, no way of getting fed spiritually or in his case, naturally. So you become spiritually desolate. It's another step to a downward decline. What happened next? And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to, to feed swine. So what are we getting out of 15? Self-abasement. Self-abasement. What does self-abasement mean? It's feelings of shame. It's feelings of humiliation. It's feelings of guilt. That's the next stage in his downward decline. Self-abasement. Where do we see it? We see it right there. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he went and fed swine. He was humiliated because in his, if he had stayed in his natural position, feeding swine was beneath him. His father was a man of prominence. He held a position of honor. But because he did what he wanted to do and he ended up in this situation, he was humiliated, he felt guilty, and he felt shame. The man was feeding pigs. And what happened next? And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He hit rock bottom when he hit the point of starvation. 
What is starvation? De deprivation of nutrition. Lacking the substance needed to survive. Now we're talking about in the natural is deprivation of nutrition, lacking the substance needed to survive. So look at that from the spiritual aspect. Lacking the substance needed to survive. It means you're at a point spiritually where you lack everything that you need to maintain a spiritual life. You're becoming spiritually dead. You're not getting any word. You're not getting any prayer. You're not getting any fasting. Nobody is praying for you. Nobody is praying with you. You don't have the power and the strength to pray for yourself. You are spiritually starving to death. You're dying spiritually. You're hitting rock bottom because when you have no nutrients, when you have nothing in you to empower you, you lay the waste. You're at rock bottom. You don't even have strength to move. You're just there. And that was his seven steps of decline. Self-will, selfishness, separation, sensuality, spiritual destitution, self-abasement, and starvation. And when you get to that point, you're spiritually at rock bottom. There is nothing to do but either die or find your way back up. So what did this young man do? What's the example being shown? Well, let's read. And when he came to himself, he, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? So what, what's the first step of this reconciliation that we see right there in verse 17? Realization. Realization. What does realization mean? To become fully aware of some fact. To become fully aware of some spiritual truth. So what is it that this young man became aware of? That his father had servants that were in a better position than he was in. That his father's house had food and food to spare. He realized that he no longer had to be in the position he was in. Spiritually, you have to get to the point where you realize you don't have to be in the position you're in. So when you realize it, what's the next step after realization? Well, let's read. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. What's that step right there? It's called resolution. It's called resolve. What does that mean? It means making a firm, to see, a firm decision to do something. And I've spoken to so many people about this. When you're in a position and you're thinking on something and you're dwelling on something, and then something settles over you where you know what you're going to do and nobody can talk you out of it and you're comfortable with it, that's called resolve. That's what that is. And when resolution, when resolve sets in, it's almost impossible to change anybody's mind. So after he realized the situation he was in, that resolve set in. I know what I'm going to do, and nothing is going to stop me from doing it. So what happens next? It says, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What is that right there? That's called repentance. Repentance. What is repentance? Displaying sincere regret and remorse for something and turning completely away from it. That's the part that a lot of people in church miss out. Repentance is not just asking for forgiveness, but it means to turn completely away from it. You have no intent of doing that thing again. That's true repentance. Now, some of us, we battle and we struggle with certain strongholds that's been in our life, or we battle and struggle with certain things that we have done, and no matter how many times we repent, it seems like we fall back into it, but the difference is, it is not purposely intended when we fall. We still fight and struggle with certain things, and until we come to a place of complete and total deliverance, we battle with this thing, and sometimes we battle over and over. Some battles are harder than others, but to repent 
is to turn completely away from it with no intent of going back to it. So what's the next step? We read verse 20 and it says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It's called return. Returning, returning. What is returning? To go back to a person or a place. To go back to a person or a place. You had to return to a place. And that's something else that a lot of people don't teach in today's, in today's worship services. Sometimes you have to go back to a place to make it right. Sometimes you have to go back to a person and make it right. That's after you repent and get it right with God. Sometimes you have to go back to that brother. Sometimes you have to go back to that sister and you have to make it right. And understand that returning and repentance and forgiveness is not for the other person. It's for you. So if God has been compelling you to go back to whoever and to apologize, to go back to whoever and make it right. Understand that is part of the process of getting back to the place where you fell from. There is no growth without repentance. There is no repentance without forgiveness. So you have to return. You have to go back. Let's find out what's going on. Is there anything else in that verse? Is something else in that verse? Let me read the verse again. And he arose and came to his father, but he was yet a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What else is going on in verse 22? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. I mean, that's verse 20. To bring back together again and make differing views compatible. That's what reconciliation is. Listen to me. To bring back together again and make differing views compatible. Christ reconciled us back to the Father. Make differing views compatible. God did not change his view on anything. Our view had to be made compatible with his. We had to be brought back together with him. Christ became that 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 that, that, that middle that middle. He became that middle to bring us back to the Father, and our view had to change to match the Father's view. That's the only way we can be brought back. God's view will never change. We had to return to him, and we had to return with a different mindset. He took down that middle partition, that middle wall. He moved a veil out of the way. That's another thing. Thank you, Lord. For all of you who keep sitting under these preachers, who keep talking about going behind the veil, you need to ask them, what veil are you going behind? Because the veil was written twain. Jesus moved the veil out of the way. The veil had to do with the old covenant. The veil had to do with the law. We are under grace. There is no veil separating us and God. He moved that out of the way. And we're reconciled. So what happens next? And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But his father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Reclothing. Reclothing. The next step was reclothing. What is reclothing? to dress again in suitable attire. So how are we reclosed spiritually? God covers us with the blood of Jesus. When we fall away and we go back out into that world and we start getting covered with the muck and mire of sin, we have to repent, we have to return, we have to be re-cleansed, we have to be reclothed, if you will, with that spirit, with the presence of the spirit, with the blood of the lamb, because no sin can stay in his presence. No filthiness can stay in his presence. And I thank the Lord again, he's given me another thought to give to you right now. Listen, 
for all of those people who keep sitting under ministers who keep saying there is none righteous, no, not one. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Yes, scripture says that. But when you come into the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ and you become filled with the Holy Spirit, you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it's not about your righteousness. It's about become the righteousness of God. You have to understand what transformation takes place when you're saved. No, we are not righteous in and of ourselves. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But now that I'm saved, I become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what happens next? Let's read. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to be merry. What's the last step? Rejoicing rejoicing. And what does that mean? To display tremendous joy and genuine delight in a person or a situation. Now, first of all, we, are, we already understand <clears throat> that when somebody is originally saved, there's rejoicing in heaven with the angels. So how much more joy is there in the presence of God when somebody who fell away is re reunited with the father? How much rejoicing is going on? And we, we, I, I don't, I don't want you to ever believe. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, especially you babes in Christ, you, you who are still struggling with something, you who still fighting strongholds, you who still have your ups and downs. I don't ever want you to believe and don't ever allow anybody to tell you that God gets mad at you to the point where he don't want to talk to you anymore. That God gets mad at you to the point where he's not hearing your prayers. That God gets mad at you because what they're doing is they're putting human emotion on God. But when God said, I know the thoughts I think towards you, when God said his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways, when God said, man, look what on the outer appearance, I look on the heart, what I need you to understand, what Holy Spirit is trying to get you to understand is God don't think like we think and God don't operate the way we operate. God is so full of love. God is always standing there waiting to forgive. God is always ready to fill you with joy and happiness. God is so ready to wipe your tears away. God don't hold grudges. God don't throw stuff back up in your face. That's not how God operates. That's how man operates. So when somebody constantly tells you that God is getting sick and tired of you, that God is not going to forgive you, that God is mad at you, what they're doing is they're projecting onto you how they deal with situations, how they think and how they feel. But always remember they are not God. They are not the one that saved you. God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. God is long suffering. God is patient. God is kind. God is meek. God is gentle. God is always waiting to forgive you. He is always waiting to wash you. He is always waiting to anoint you. He is always waiting to restore you. God is always there to give you hope. And we need to teach this more in the church, in the body of Christ. No matter how powerful of a sermon you may preach, no matter how much fire and brimstone may go forward, we are never supposed to leave the body of God without hope. We are never supposed to leave the people without hope. These are the people that Jesus died for. So if Jesus died to give us hope, who are we to take that hope away? That is not what we're called to do. Yes, we're called to preach the word. Yes, we're called to teach the word. Yes, the word is used to bring correction and the word will tear down and destroy. But it doesn't stop there. It also builds up. It restores. It breathes life into. It leaves you with hope. Seven stages down. They all start with the letter S. So does sin. We have self-will, selfishness, separation, sensuality, spiritual destitution, self-abasement, and starvation. Then when you hit rock bottom, you have seven stages up that begins with R, with repentance. And we have realization, 
resolution, repentance, return, reconciliation, reclothing, and rejoicing. All of that is in the story of the prodigal son. It's so much more than just having and falling and getting up. It's progressive. It's progressive down. It's progressive up. So, so why would God allow us to see these different stages? Because when you're called to soul winning, when you're called to counseling, when you're called, when somebody is telling you what's going on in their personal life, when somebody is telling you what's going on within them, see, see the world today keeps talking about mental health and they keep putting this great emphasis on mental health. And I am in no way speaking against mental health because I've been dealing with that my whole life. I've shared these things with you. But see, what we have to understand is the way the world views mental health and the way the spirit views mental health is two completely different things. You have these therapists out here. Their job is to get you on medication. I don't care how you cut it. Their job is to get you on medication. And that's what it's going to lead to. And once they get you on that medication, it's so hard to get off. Because you're going to be addicted to that medication. That medication is nothing but a spirit. Because it alters the way you think. It alters the way you perceive. I was on Haldol. I was on Demerol. I was on Thorazine. So you can't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Not just from research, but from experience. I told you if I'm not there, I'm not going to tell you I was. But I've been there. I know what it's like to be dependent on a medication to be able to go to sleep. I know what it's like to be dependent on a medication to wake you up. I know what it's like when your mind is constantly thinking, but you cannot formulate the words and you're slobbing and you're drooling because that medication they put in your system is slowing down your natural sense. That's how the world deals with depression. That's how the world deals with mental health. But spiritually, when we allow Holy Spirit to come in and when we sit in front of people who's going to speak spirit and speak truth and speak life, rightly divided word into us, we don't need to dope ourselves up. The only thing we have to do is submit. We always talk about resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Yes, but before you can resist the devil and he flee from you, you got to deal with the first part of the scripture that says submit to God. You have to be willing to submit. And so when, when, when we're counseling people in the body, when we, when we have people that come to us and pour themselves out to us, we have people that come to us and tell us what's going on in their life, we have to be able to recognize where they are spiritually. We have to be able to recognize the space they're in spiritually. And that's what the prodigal son story is supposed to be for those of us called to a counseling ministry. We have to be able to recognize the different steps of decline so we can guide them to the significant steps of return. But if we don't take time to analyze and dissect the word of God, you will never be able to successfully understand where somebody is when they come to you. When somebody talks about killing themselves, when somebody gets to the point where they're ready to commit suicide, please understand they don't just wake up one morning and say, okay, I think today is a good day to die. No. There are some steps people go through before they get to the place because suicide is rock bottom. Listen to me. When you reach rock bottom and you reach that point where you're ready to take your own life, it's because you have progressed so far down and you feel like there's no hope and there's nowhere else to go. So when we're speaking to these people, when God allows us to speak into these people's lives, we have to have a spiritually discernment so that Holy Spirit can show us where they are in their decline. Because you might catch them right at the very beginning. You might catch them at the end. You might not catch them till they're at rock bottom. But no matter where it is you're able to catch them, you have to be able to instill hope into their life. You have to let them know there is another way. 
And I'm here to tell you again from experience, there are some people who are gifted enough to catch you on that downward decline and start to speak life into you, not by beating you over the head with a bunch of scriptures, but by being able to understand where you are and being able to speak to you where you are because they've been there. If you have never dealt with somebody with mental health issues who are getting to the point of suicidal thoughts, I don't suggest you try to just jump into it. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. And listen to me when I tell you this, because I say it to you from the bottom of my heart. Some of you, some of us still have problems dealing with some of the things we've done in life. Some of us still have problems forgiving ourselves for certain things we may have said and done 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And we're still trying to navigate our way through this with a sound peace of mind. So if you're not called to speak to people in a counseling position, especially people dealing with mental health, and somebody turns to you and they tell you, I think I'm ready to kill myself, and you give them advice that has nothing to do with the situation. You're quoting a bunch of scriptures. You're telling them a bunch of something that don't amount to nothing. And you find out the next day that they took their life. That is something that you are not prepared to deal with. I'm telling you right now, you are not prepared to deal with it. It will destroy you. So if somebody comes to you in that space, and you know that's not a space God has called you to, please do not try to operate in it. Get somebody who's equipped spiritually and mature enough to handle the situation and hand that thing off. That does not make you any less of a saint. It does not make you any less of a minister. It does not make you any less of a child of God. What it does is it makes you responsible in the eyes of God, responsible in the eyes of man, because you're not trying to be something you're not called to be. You do not want somebody else's death on your conscience when they came to you for help and you couldn't help them, but you tried to do it anyway. Turn it over to somebody else in the name of Jesus, I beg you. And those of us who are called to counsel, those of us who are called to speak into somebody else's life, we still have to respect the process that they're going through. We cannot expect them to go from point A to point Z overnight because we want them to get to point Z. If you're not willing to walk them through it, and sometimes walking them through it will take hours, or take days, or take weeks, or take months. If you're not committed to the process, get out of the way. If you're not ready for somebody to call you at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning crying, and it calls for you to listen and stop talking so much, get out of the way. If you're not committed to seeing it all the way to the end, get out of the way. Because the worst thing you can do is make somebody feel like you're there for them, make somebody feel like you're ready to listen to them, and then they start to get on your nerves, and you feel like they're calling you too much, they're calling you at the wrong time, because your attitude and the words you speak and the way you speak it is going to be projected through that phone, and people are going to know you're tired of them, and it's going to make them feel like they don't care either. I thought they were different. I thought they really loved me. I thought they meant it when they said you can call me day or night. And let me be the first to tell you again from experience, brothers and sisters, especially those of you in ministry. It's too many men and women of God who open their mouth and tell people you can call me day or night. It doesn't matter. Call me and I'll be there. It's too many people who tell people that and you know you don't mean it. And they find out you don't mean it. Because when they call you, you duck them. When they call you, you know we got phones now that tell us who calling. You see a name and you don't even answer the phone. Or when they give you their number, you don't lock their number in the phone. So when somebody calls, it says unknown caller and you don't answer the phone. 
And these are the people that's calling out to you to help save their very life. But because you don't want to do the work, you leave them by the wayside. And then when you find out they actually did kill themselves, or you find out they went to the school and shot up the school, or you find out they went home and they beat and killed their kids, or you find out they went to the job and killed half of their co-workers, then you want to say, well, it's because his parents didn't do this, that, and the other. No. How about it's because they came to you, man of God. They came to you, woman of God, looking for help, and you turned them away. You were that last step of hope, and you shut them down. You cut them off. You turned them away. So if you're not in it for the long haul, get out the way. If God didn't call you, get out the way. If you don't have a true heart of compassion, get out the way. If you don't have a true heart of love, get out the way. And let those of us who don't mind getting up out of our bed at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when we got to be at work at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning to do the work of the Lord, leave that to us. To those of us who don't mind, we had a 12, 13 hour day and we're sitting on our couch in our underwear, watching a, a, a TV program, eating a bowl of ice cream and the phone ring and you got to put your clothes back on and drive two or three hours one way to say a prayer, to give a hug, to develop some food, to help somebody. Because that's what ministry is. Ministry ain't standing behind the pulpit preaching a message. Ministry is getting off your butt and putting your words to action and showing the love of Christ. When I was in jail, you came to see me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. That's ministry. If you're not committed to it, please get out the way. And ask Holy Spirit, those of you who are committed, to show you how to be able to identify when somebody is spiritually declining. Allow him to show you those who have hit rock bottom. And allow him to give you the knowledge, the wisdom, but more so the understanding of how to counsel and guide somebody from rock bottom back up to that place of rejoicing. He who saves souls is wise. If you're not in ministry to save souls, if you're not in ministry to lead people to Christ, what are you in it for? If you're one of those ones that's in ministry to get rich quick, you're going to stay broke. If you're those, one of those ones that's in ministry because you want to see who you can sleep with, listen. Listen. You got some churches that's full of whoremongers and adulterers and fornicators and all that old other stuff. Go join one of them churches. It's a whole lot of that in the church of God in Christ. Oh yeah, I said it. But if you're one of those ones who sincerely love Jesus and you have a genuine love for people, and you want to help people live and not die, and you want to speak life in the people, and you want to speak hope in the people, then when they call you, answer the phone. When they knock on your door, open the door. When people tell you they're hurting, take time to listen. When people come to you crying, stop trying to say everything and hear what they're saying. Allow people to pour their heart out and ask God to show you where they are. So then when it's time for you to speak, you know how to lead them back to that place of rejoicing. That's what ministry is all about. There are a thousand people who will testify on my behalf because I'm not fake or phony with this. There are a thousand people who will testify that you can ring my phone at one, two or three o'clock in the morning. All you need to say is I need you and I'm dressed and I'm there because I'm real about ministry. I was going through, there was a point in my life, listen to me, I'm transparent with mine. There was a point in my life where there were situations going on in my life where I would turn the ringer off. I wouldn't want nobody to call me at two or three o'clock in the morning because it was too much that came with it. But God asked me a question one day. God said, I called you my prophet. 
I saved you. I chose you to speak life in the people. I've had signs and wonders following you before you understood what signs and wonders were. I've used you to lay hands on sick and watch them recover. I've used you to speak life in the people who are ready to die. I've used you in so many areas of life. So when did you decide to allow life situations and circumstances to dictate when you're available for ministry and when you're not? And that thing cut me deep. Because the reason I'm still alive today, the reason I have breath in my body is, is to serve my God. I'm called to a higher calling. So I don't have time to worry about what the job or anybody else thinks. I don't have time to worry about, Lord, I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to turn my ringer off. No, no, no. Because God might say, yeah, you got to get up at five o'clock in the morning for that job. But the job I have you on is going to require you to get up at 3.30 in the morning because somebody just got shot. Somebody's at the hospital about to die. And you're the one that I'm sending down there to speak life into that situation so I can show them and I can show everybody in that hospital I'm still God. And if you have a spouse, if you have a husband or a wife, if you live in the house with your parents and you have a father or a mother, if you have a roommate, male, female, or whatever, and they don't understand the ministry you're in and the call of God that's on your life, and that sometimes you're going to be called in the wee hours of the night, if they don't understand that, then you need to check who's around you. Because you are not going to be able to please God and man. The question is, which one is more important to you? That's what this type of ministry boils down to. Now, if you're just one of them preachers who want some money, or you can have a service in the morning, you can have a service in the afternoon, collect your offering plate, go home, sit on the couch, and wait till next week. If that's what you want to do, that's between you and God. If you're one of those preachers who don't want people to tell you their intimate business, then I suggest you have an online ministry and don't answer no comments and don't answer no calls. But that's between you and God. But if you're one of those preachers who have a heart after Christ, if you're one of those preachers who want to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ, if you're one of them people who want to be a living witness of what a true child of God looks like and sounds like, turn your phone on, answer the calls, get up out the bed, even when you're tired, and go show somebody what Jesus is all about. Stop talking the talk if you're not ready to walk the walk. It's too many talkers in the church now. It's not enough doers. But if you're not called to this, please get out of our way. Get out of our way. Because I don't mind showing Jesus Christ through my actions. I don't mind having compassion and love. I don't mind crying with you. I don't mind praying with you. I don't mind coming to you if it's raining or if it's sunny. I don't mind setting aside what I wanted to do because there's a greater need because there's some ministry that has to take place. I don't mind because that's what I'm here to do. Learn the steps down and learn the steps back up because we want to go from self-will to realization. We want to go from selfishness to resolution. We want to go from separation to repentance. We want to go from sensuality to return. We want to go from spiritual destitution to reconciliation. We want to go from self-abasement to being reclothed. And we want to go from starvation to rejoicing. If you're not called and cut out to do the work, get out of the way to those of us who are. Because I speak life. 
And I speak hope. Because that's what he called me to do. Short lesson. I hope somebody got something out of it. If you didn't, flip to another YouTube channel and try somebody else. But here on Sound Doctrine, we rightly divide the word of God and we speak truth and we speak life. I love you. I praise God for those of you who tuned in. I hope you got something out of it that helps you along the way. Most of you probably already knew it. So I'm only sharing with you something you already know. And I praise God for that too. Because every time I'm able to teach you, I'm still able to learn something. Walk in wisdom. Grow in grace. I'm going to get me some ice cream and some cookies. Be blessed.